So I am going to um, record and share this um, video online. So I got permission from Dr. Bang, but if you don't want to be in the recording, I see nine people right now here. Uh, please turn off your camera and then you will not ha have any concern about sharing, uh, having online, okay? Being online. Okay, thank you all for, for coming. And um, I understand very, very international, including a student from Egypt and Lebanon. So uh, in addition to students from Turkey, so I'm glad to hear that uh, I, I try to work with international students here. And China. Uh, yeah. So um, I have to remember, I haven't used Teams in a while. So to share my screen on Teams, can you see that yeah. now? Now we can see it, yes. Oh, okay. So I gave a talk a month or so ago to people in Botswana who weren't there. <laughs> they, they actually, they tried to come, but their bandwidth didn't allow them to. So I recorded them. So this talk is actually the, the first part of that recording uh, that I sent you. So you've, you've, if you, you've already seen this. So I'm gonna apologize. If you've watched the videos that I sent, you've already seen this first part. Um, but maybe I can explain it in a different way and talk about it differently. If you haven't watched it, then, you know, you can benefit from it too, maybe. So the notes and the PowerPoint for this is at trainingshare.com under archived talks. Look at the left-hand side, it says archived talks. And by the way, today is going to be, when I get done with this, my 300th day running in a row. I, I've not cut my hair in 300 days, as you can tell. I've been running every day for 300 days, and I have not been—I had not been to my office until last week. It was the first time in nine months. So um, COVID is causing us to try out different things. And for me, um, if you're a Facebook friend of mine, you can read every day my my. Facebook blog posts on running every day and pictures of Indiana. I get interested. So uh, in between writing books, I like to go jogging and um, listen to music when I run or books or whatever. So I'm going to do part one. So introducing the, the Education 2020 model. Now 2020 stands for 2020 vision. So your vision, your 2020 vision, right? Some people don't have good vision. They have less than 2020 vision and they're off, they're steering off the road a little bit. But we'll try to create a pathway for learning in the 21st century. And that's part of the 2020 model. What I found are certain principles of what some would call truths. There are some truths out there about what works and what doesn't work. And so we know that in terms of meaningfulness, authenticity, relevant learning is more powerful than teacher-centered instruction. There are certain truths. I'll, I'll get at 20 truths to learning, what I feel are, well, 19 of them. You'll, you can come up with number 20. I'll also talk about 20 roles of the instructor, and so we'll get at that. But I think what the world needs right now is a little love. And so often at the beginning of my classes, I will play a short video clip, in this case, a virtual choir of students, showing us how we can use technologies in unique ways. And this way, it's a social icebreaking tool to get people to think and interact and discuss and reflect. But in, it has additional appeal, this, this song today, after all the turmoil in the USA over the past week. Definitely the world needs some love. And it's fortunate that we have such videos available to us. We are moving from an age of Wikipedia to Videopedia, Musicpedia. There's, there's a lot of video today that wasn't possible 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. You see your instructors recording this. 20 years ago, he wouldn't have been able to record this in the ways he can now, not as efficiently. The technologies have enabled us to store and put away information that we can reuse, repurpose, remix, recreate, and share. 
And to me, that's one of the more powerful outcomes of the educational technology field since I entered it 35 or so years ago. The fact that we can take video and not have it just on a television or on a cassette tape, but have it come with us in our flash memory sticks in our pockets, we can have all the world's knowledge eventually available to us in, the, in our pockets or on our mobile phones. So when that happens, when that happens, we have a chance to truly change the world for the better. We have a chance to make an impact that we could never have done before. Learning around the globe. And so today, what do I have? We've got students from Turkey, right? But, and Egypt and Lebanon and so forth. This was also not as possible 20 years ago, although 20 years ago, I connected two video conferencing systems together called PictureTel and CUCME to bring in the instructors whose, or the professors whose articles we were reading and we were able to utilize their articles and bring them in live and have the authors talk to my students about their research, about what didn't get in the article, what did get in the article, what they would do differently, what they are currently working on in terms of their research. That was a sea change. That was a gigantic change in education. That was 1995, okay? So what is that? That's 26 years ago. That happened. And since then, tools like, we're, we're using Microsoft Teams here, S tools like Zoom, tools like, you know, Google, uh, various Google Hangouts and Skype. All these tools have sprung up recently, but they weren't the only things that were being used uh, 20 years ago. There are a lot of other tools. In fact, 30 years ago, I did a national survey on cooperative uh, and collaborative technologies for writing. And the tools in 1990 for collaborative writing were immense. They were powerful. And so today we think it's really unique. We think today's tools like a virtual choir is unique. A lot of this has been done for quite a while. We're just figuring it out, how to use it in pedagogically sound and effective ways. And so uh, today I'm, amazed by what is possible. But I've been amazed for three decades. What we have to move beyond amazement to implementation, to sharing, to advocacy, to making a transformation in our instruction. We can no longer rely on incremental small changes. As we see in our respective places that we are from, whether it's Egypt or Lebanon or Turkey or the USA, there are immense problems that are being faced that are educational, cultural, social, political, and other societal. That education has a chance to, educational technology today has a chance to make a difference. Today, educational technology is making a difference. By the way, in the chat window, if you've ever been to the North America, if you could type in the chat window, yes, you have, or no, you haven't, or you don't understand the language, Okay, um, if you ever saw me speak before, put in the chat window if you saw me speak and how many times, um, but maybe you haven't, maybe you find me rather boring, okay. Um, so we'll get to Education 2020 now and our vision for the future because we need to think ahead today about the role of emerging technologies in education to help the underprivileged, people have left behind to help the gifted and talented all learners to get them access to instruction to resources to content to sharing so we're in the midst of a disruptive age because not only because of the waves of technology coming at us in succession, we had Web 2.0 a decade ago or about 15 years ago, it was called Web 2.0. And now we don't call it 3.0 or 4.0. We just have these massive waves coming at us over and over and over. And so I wrote an article, the preface to the ETR&D special issue about the waves 
And um, with David Wiley, who's an expert in open education, and I, if I've not sent that to your instructor, I will send that after we're done. You'll have to remind me um, at the end of this. So write that down, Olgan. Um, so we've got these waves coming at us that are causing teachers to be confused, frustrated, um, unsure of the, where they're going, and, and, and worried that they're not being trained well enough to utilize those technologies. At the same time, they're optimistic about the possibilities of those. And so we've, we've, we've got these waves at, and we've got COVID. And COVID is forcing all the people who were previously concerned, trepid, nervous, frustrated, uh, and, and some just saying, I will never use a, a, a technology in my class. I'll never go online. I'll never do blended. Those same people who are not, not doing blended or not doing fully online are being forced to teach in, in online environments. And it's causing them to try out. Last March, last April, last May, there was more experimentation taking place in the field of education than had ever taken place previously because everybody around the world is being forced to do it. And because they were forced to do it, because they were forced to try stuff out, they now have lesson plans that they can reutilize this fall in their classes. They might have been really nervous people, you know, six months or nine months or a year ago. Today, they moved to phase two. So phase, phase one, there's, there's like five phases that we go through to integrate technology in our classes, right? So the first phase is awareness. You become aware of new technologies. The second phase is resistance. Nobody wants to change. I don't want to change when my department chair or my dean says you have to try something new to teach a new class. We all are resistant to new ideas. So you go through phase one is awareness, phase two is resistance. Phase three is understanding what's possible. Phase four is doing something with that. Phase five becomes, you know, sharing, sharing what you did. And phase six becomes advocacy, trying to get others around your whole school or university or your community to use it. So we've gone through phase one and two into phase three and into phase four because of COVID. COVID has forced us into moving from awareness resistance to understanding and doing something with it. And so some of us, like your instructor, are in phase five or phase six, sharing and advocacy. And some of you in the audience before coming here, we're talking about sharing and openness and all that. So COVID has provided that push that we needed, just like in California. And you might remember, you know, um, maybe you don't, the early days of online learning, right? In California, they were forced to put their syllabus on the, on the internet back in 1996 or 97, and no one wanted to do it. And they had protest marches. You know, we had a protest last week at Washington, D.C. People protested online learning, not the same way, not with guns and violence, but they protested online learning and they stood outside because students were charged an extra fee for having online syllabi and the faculty in humanities uh, had to put these on, the English literature, all these, and they were, they hated online learning. Well, a decade later, you look, and that was UCLA, Uni Uni University of Cal uh, California at Los Angeles, UCLA was doing that. And today, UCLA is a leader. They were forced to do it. And that it was a top down. Top down doesn't work typically, but it, it works to some degree. And the same with COVID. COVID is a top down. We are forced to do it. And it got people to experiment, to try things out in new ways. And so now everybody in your department can have a discussion about online learning or a blended learning because they've done it. They got the experience of doing it. And this is a totally new ball game, a totally new. It's an American expression, to totally new mm, uh, environment for teaching and learning that had never existed before. 
And that's why the field of educational technology today is more respected and understood than it's ever been. I mean, my mother, before she died five years ago, was reading about online learning in the front page of the paper because it became the news. In, you know, 20 years ago, no one knew what this was. 30 years ago, I'm, I'm a product of distance learning. I took television courses and correspondence to get into graduate school because I, I'm trained as an accountant or a CPA in my former life. Okay? Then I got trained in educational psychology in a physical environment. Now I'm in educational technology. And so people are understanding what remote learning is and isn't. And some people are calling alarms. They want to have it better. They want to have it improved. So if you get a job in the field, your job will be to improve this, to help out. And so we see all these charts about learners and how much time we spend online. You know, too much time online, too much screen time might not be good for your eyesight or brain processing or your sleep or whatever. So we need new guidelines. We need new instructional design models. Uh, we need new assessment practices. And so because of COVID, people are coming up with new ways to assess learning, distinct ways. There, departments of education in the United States are putting aside policies, putting aside procedures that have existed for decades and saying they're no longer required to have an uh, ending test no longer required to have a standardized exam, no longer required to have an entrance exam we call the ACTs and SATs, not required in many universities now. It's a gigantic change because we no longer have to teach to the test. We can teach for creativity. We can teach for freedom of thought. And that wasn't possible because we were previously constrained by our assessments. Assessments, funnel the entire system, the what's called American expression, the tail wags the dog. The tail at the end is the exam and it wags the dog. It gets everybody focused on that exam. We no longer have to be focused on the exam. We can now be focused on the activities, the pedagogies, the interactivities to engage the learners, to immerse the learners. And so whether we're in India or in Turkey, or in China, we've got educational technologies coming out from all places. When I visited China five years ago, my second trip to China, I went to the Silicon Valley of China in Beijing. And let me tell you, they have more educational technologies companies coming up than, the, than America does. They went from 600 educational technology companies in 2014 to 1,200 educational technology companies in 2015. They doubled. And by now, 2020, who knows? For They're creating companies for um, uh, language learning, gaming, lecture capture, uh, you, you name it. They have, a, they have technologies that they're, they're building there in China and around the world. So the field of educational technology is being felt by my brothers and my sisters and my friends. They feel the, the, this field. They understand more what we do than ever before. It, it, educational technology or instructional technology or IST as we call it here, nobody knew what the heck that was about. But now my brother's got to take an online learning course to keep his, you know, um, his job, to, to maintain his skills, professional development. And so we not only have that, we have MOOCs, Massive Open Online Learning. I've got three MOOC books. You know, we've got all this MOOCs, 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 MOOCs. And, uh, you know, I got friends around the world doing MOOCs. We got kids in Nepal who are teenagers. You've got that silly book over there. Yeah, yeah, that silly one. Okay. We got, we got, <laughs> ah, signature. Okay. That might be worth money. Um, <laughs> you know, kids in Nepal are teenagers and they're not going to school right now because of COVID. And their parents are coming home at night thinking they're playing games online. And 
these teenage kids are not playing games online. They're taking classes in paleontology, in astrophysics, in Egyptian culture. They were talking about um, our friends from Egypt there. Um, they were taking courses learning English from Berkeley and from Harvard and getting certificates in English from Harvard for free. You know, so if, if teenage teenagers, 14 year olds, 13 year olds, 15 year olds can learn English for free and get a certificate from Harvard. So to better prepare them for college, the world is changing. The world is changing in front of our eyes today. This is a new ball game. This is, a, this is, this is we are, we have created in education the space and for, for possibilities to learn, the openness to learn. And to talk, I talked to these kids in Nepal. We have them as a guest in, in our class two months ago. And they're pretty smart, you know, and they're very self-directed. So what's mm -hmm. happening today is a movement towards self-directed online learning. And when I was taking courses, getting ready for graduate school, I was self-directing, taking correspondence and correspondence courses and TD courses. I was self-directing my learning, right? Today, we've got probably 80 or 90% of learning is informal learning, self-directed learning in many ways. And so most learning is not like this. This is quasi-formal learning, right? Most learning today is informal learning from Wikipedia or TED Talks, some kind of YouTube video or whatever, the news you see. And so we can scale it up because the resources are there to scale it up uh, all around the world. Um, so there are some 258 million youth around the world are out of school. 617 million are in school, um, but not learning the basics. So how can we change that? Okay. 53% of children in low and middle income um, countries cannot read or understand a simple story. How can we change that? So there's a huge and pressing need to change the educational focus. And we can't go back to Confucius times of just respecting the instructor. There has to be more focus on the, the learner taking control of the learning process, but providing those resources as an instructor to guide that. So how do you get in between kind of a halfway point towards what's what I call guided discovery learning? You don't want pure self-directed. You don't want just discovery learning. You want to have it be scaffolded or somehow um, guided in a way so the learners can have a chance to reflect on that learning, get some feedback on the learning and so forth. And so I talked to Confucius. I was in Taiwan there. I was at the Conf uh, Confucius Institute, and I talked to him, you know, about books. books. This is my handbook of blended learning. It, it can hold up my laptop. That's all this is good for, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, today we read digital books on our mobile devices, or I listen in my car, or in my running, in my, my iPod. So... We can't go back to Confucius times, but we can learn from Confucius, some respect for the instructor and so forth, but we have to move ahead. Move ahead from 1990, when I did that national survey on, on collaborative technologies, to 2020, 2021 now. And today, anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time. And so we can have a young girl or boy in the Philippines learning from a researcher in Antarctica. So I have in my World is Open book, my friend Cassandra Brooks, who was interacting with kids from Antarctica every night at 11 o'clock at night when they had internet on the boat. She's on a ship in Antarctica. She's talking to kids about her research place on the Antarctic toothfish. We had Cassandra on our television, I have a television show, our webcast show, uh, a web show, every Saturday night at 5.30 p.m. USD, uh, Eastern time, 
not UST, Eastern Time, EST. Uh, I'm not sure if that might be midnight or 1230 in Turkey. You're seven hours different, Olgan? What's that? Eight hours. Eight hours. Sorry, it's 1.30 in the morning, I, I, yes. but they're all saved and archived. This week, we have a penguin researcher. Before, before you join, we talk about the silver lining for learning website. So, Great. So take a look at silver lining. We've done 42 shows. Or maybe this is a 42nd one coming up. Maybe that's it. Yeah. So um, every week, pretty much every week on Saturdays at 5.30 USD. Sometimes we go in the morning, which would be easier for you all. But today we can all learn from people around the world can influence us. Older people in nursing homes, centenarians over 100 years old are living in Chicago, mentoring kids in Brazil about English. And so we have many programs being created today to have international collaboration, international mentoring and exchanges. That's phenomenal. So I'm going to talk a bit, bit about my Education 2020 model. I want to make sure I'm probably talking too much. How much time do we have left? So we have time. So depending on your, um, we scheduled it for one hour. So hour. we can finish at 1.10. But uh, as long as hour. you want to continue, we'd love to listen to you. But depend. so. Okay, you, yeah, you if they're not falling asleep yet, well, we'll see. So I've got this model I'm calling Education 2020, but I didn't finish the book. So it's a secret. And um, can you hear the audio? You could hear it? OK. Uh, not right now, but it's okay. was, was it short? I didn't hear. It was very short. It's OK. He says, keep it secret in the audio. So please keep this secret. It's not published yet. You're getting the insider scoop. So Education 2020. Some people talk about Education 3.0 or Education 4.0. In Thailand, when I visit Bangkok, they talk about Education 3.0 and 4.0. And that's when the instructor moves away from lectures to more project-based kinds of learning, self-directed learning guided discovery learning, as I might call it. That's very similar to Education 2020, where classrooms are like a cafe. Classrooms are a place where people have a chance to interact, engage, discuss, clarify in new ways, things that they were thinking previously, but they hadn't thought about in, in this exact way. They're, they're thinking about ideas that have yet to get on paper, yet to get in a project. And you have a chance to talk to other people, other students, other instructors, and get their feedback before committing to idea. idea. It's more of, a, of like a, a think tank. Teaching is like a think tank, thinking about ideas, writing a little bit, reflecting, discussing, sharing, interacting, and, and your examination is not on the final product. It's about process. It's about your growth over time. It's about your meta reflection on what you're able to do and contribute. It's about your creativity and originality and inspiration, the motivation, the freedom, the expression. And so my new book, Making Impact, that I'm calling the book, is about stories that are making an impact in education the one I'm working, the book I'm working on right now. Um, but really, it comes down to creating connections between your students, among your students, and beyond to global peers out there. And so giving students, allowing them the freedom to explore. I think the key word in education in the 21st century is freedom. In the past, schools were like prisons, and many schools are still prisons and constraining people, locking them down and, 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 and you know, strapping them into a desk that doesn't move. And to, to preset books, you, you have to read this book and I will test you on this book. And that's the way education was for a long time. But it's no longer about this silly book. We don't need this silly book. What we need is to have students create their own books 
so 15 years ago, 14 years ago, I had a couple of wiki book projects where students wrote the books for the class. Students create the book. They get empowerment to do so. And so we move away from the teacher as a judge, teacher as a credit manager, teacher just sitting and monitoring and watching over everything the student does to being a teacher that facilitates, co-moderates, co-learns. We have to move away from the models where the teacher is this authority figure. I mean, really in a classroom, this fish could be as much an authority as I am. In fact, he probably knows, don't you? He knows more than me, you know. So the instructor is there as a resource. We need to move to what Vygotsky said, is that we assist in the learning process. We can only assist. We can, we can support our students. There's two things teachers do. We challenge and we support students in those challenges. Teachers must challenge, we must push. We must push students to the edge of what they're capable of doing, the edge of their envelope. And then you support them in that. So you have hard tasks, you have hard activities. You make their brains hurt, right? You make their brains mushy a little bit, and then you support them so they can make sense of information. You don't just give them information over and over. You support and nudge them along, right? Yeah. So we need to move to teacher as counselor, who's there to, when, when you have problems, when the students, the groups have problems, they can go to the counselor. And, and in fact, teachers should probably have, every teacher should probably have a minor in counseling or a certificate in counseling. Probably the most important teaching skill is to be able to counsel students because there's so many resources today and so many social emotional uh, problems in schools, especially with COVID today. I mean, the psycho so, uh, emotional state of students and teachers and administrators, everybody's going bonkers crazy, right? My name is Bonk, so I can't say Bonk. So everyone's going crazy, you know? And so a counselor, someone who's there can, can assist and, and give you some gentle scaffolding. Also as a consultant, someone who can be part of the team, can maybe joins the team for a bit and then moves on to another team that uh, acts as an expert to give feedback to the group on their projects and ideas when they come to them with uh, needing advice. Someone who can weave all the golden nuggets, all the resources that we have today. And there are so many resources that we have. I mean, you know, we got all these papers to read uh, and books to read. You know, there's so many. And you get, and you, Dr. Your your professor should have told you about my free book, so he probably did. Um, so you've got that. You know, there's so much out there. We have to weave it all together to have it make some sense, like an orchestra conductor. I think that's the best metaphor, or one of the best metaphors of a teacher is is really being a, a conductor and weaving a symphony together. In part, we're a course ambassador. We're taking our class and we're putting the best of that class on the internet, on the web, to promote the class. We are sharing our contents. We are making educational technology and every other discipline available for others around the world. That may be the most important metaphor of the instructor today, to be an ambassador for the world community, to learn from your class. And so those instructors at UCLA were putting syllabi on the web. Those syllabi were what I call level one of web integration. I have a 12 level web integration continuum I published in 2000 or 2001. First it was 10 levels, it, it ended up, I think I expanded to 12. And that level one was just putting a syllabus online. Level two, you put part of your contents of the course online. Level three, you put some parts that are graded. Level four, you have a fully online course. Level five, you know, on and on. We have different levels of technology integration to putting a whole program online, putting a whole university online, and so forth and so on. So this is a small step, right? So, you know, we have what we call baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. There's a America called What About Bob, where Bob's taking baby steps all the time, right, in the movie. So get, rent that movie. If you get movies, What About Bob? And then you'll laugh all weekend uh, if you watch that movie. I guarantee you will laugh. 
there's a famous actor in America called Bill Murray, who's one of the key actors, and um, another guy, um, blanking on his name, he's also pretty famous for a movie called Jaws about sharks. Uh, he's in that, man, Richard Dreyfus. So watch the movie, What About Bob? And then think about yourself as a teacher. Every time I watch a movie, I think about myself as a teacher. I think about what I can use from the movie to help my teaching, okay? There's, every movie has something, some teaching in it. Now, they were not meant to be teaching movies, but every movie does. And in part, they can teach you about being a course ambassador to the world, right? Metaphor number five is to be a museum curator. I'm gonna find the best of the best of the best and then make those, so when people come to my museum, they can go into the museum and they can scan and look at everything in there and they say, wow, this is cool stuff. I'm gonna tell my friends about this. Well, the same should happen with your class. Your class should be so great that everyone tells their friends about or shares those things with their friends. And so you as an instructor might have, you know, as your professor knows, I have a 100 page syllabus for one class. It's called the monster syllabus. <laughs> and it has a baby monster, a mini monster that's shorter uh, and a micro monster that's really short, um, maybe only 12 pages. But I have a 100 page syllabus, everything's free. If you go to my homepage, yes. Underneath my homepage, you should be able to find, it says Monster Syllabus. It has everything you need about virtual worlds, about blended learning, about mobile learning, about collaborative learning, about e-learning, about e-books, open textbooks. Enough said. What I've done, and I get a major headache when I put that syllabus together, I don't know if I'll ever do it again, um, but what you know, I, I try to find the best of the best and make it available. And the students, they pick and choose what they want to read. Freedom, options, and choice and options are the most important factors of learning, providing options and choice within constraints. You can't let give the world to them. You have to provide, a, a, you know, 100 page or 12 page. You have to provide a template, a skeleton of the content and let them pick from the skeleton, from the template, from the monster. They pick and they choose. I, and I, in part, I, what's that? I took that class. So I, I took all your classes. And um, the great thing, uh, it was in 2013 or 2000, no, 2013, yes. So I was in your class and uh, some students were creating videos, some students were creating websites, some students are creating like a comics and everything. So it was great to have uh, those options that you feel uh, as a student more comfortable because you, you do what you want, you do what you like, and uh, you while you are learning, you enjoy. That's that's great to have those choices. Yeah, so, you know, and you still have a brain after taking my class, so, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to, you know, at first. So I've had students walk into the class saying it's too much. And, you know, especially teachers and they walk out of the class saying it's not enough. They want more. So that's the way the courses should be designed. They should be a little scary at the front end. You should give them some advices and some examples so they're not so scared. And at the end, they have something to walk away with and reuse. And so in part, a teacher is a concierge in a hotel providing guidelines and guidance as to what they might see that day, what they might visit, what they might use. We are all concierges in some way when we give advice to our students, when we talk to them and, and say, you know, today's a rainy day out there. You might want to go inside to museums. Well, the same is true of your content. The content changes um, all the time. People, what's relevant in the field of educational technology is constantly changing. I just got out of a dissertation proposal on a, what's called a Bitmoji classrooms, which is a very popular today in America. The topics change, and so you have to be a good concierge to, to get students moving into different directions and thinking about different things. Pull out different maps. Those maps are guides for your students. You are a camping trip guide. When I used to teach, when I started in Indiana, I'd start my class telling my students, I'm a camping trip guide. I'm gonna take you on an expedition. You get off the bus at different places and explore the countryside. And then you get back on the bus and we go to another landmark 
And you can explore that for a bit and get back on the bus and so forth. In fact, all classes should be set up like a camping trip. Every week should be a different destination to take your students to. And, uh, you know, this gentleman in Nepal, I, I didn't meet him. I have two authors in my MOOCs book are from Nepal. And um, if, you, any, if, if you'd like to read their chapter, what's happening in Nepal, it's fascinating. I'll send you that. Remind me, um, Ogan. In part, we're farmers. You know, a couple of my Turkish students took a picture of themselves on a tractor. Well, one, of, one of my Turkish students, took, she took a picture of herself on a tractor in Turkey. And I said, you're a farmer? You know, she says, no, I just was, I, I think her father is partly a farmer or something. I didn't know farms, farming was, was farming big in, in Turkey? Yes, one of the big, biggest economies in farming. Okay, I didn't realize, it, more so in Western Turkey or Eastern Turkey? All over. So uh, Turkey is pretty good in farming, uh, different parts, different products. Okay. So in part, we are farmers as instructors. We are cultivating, uh, you know, plants. We're trying to get people to grow to the edges of what the, the, the new heights we're trying to get them to grow, providing that fertilization through our contents, through our instruction, through our interactions with them. And so there are 20 roles of the instructor that I'm going to talk about in my new book, Education my book I'll write someday, Education 2020. I got three chapters done. But, you know, we all are in part a cook, in part a, a, a consultant, a, a, a colleague, a caregiver, a collaborator, you know, a change catalyst. We're all these things. The web, the internet, makes it more apparent. It's, the instruction was always hard, was always interesting, was always creative. Today with the internet, it's extremely hard to teach as people are finding out in the COVID age, but it's also extremely interesting in a, in a way to be creative and original and unique that was never possible before. And so we have to start thinking about the multiple roles of the instructor and how we can provide professional development so that instructors have a chance to push students to new heights, to learn in different ways and to connect to people around the world so they have students who are in other countries who are their peers, just like this class is. You have students from other countries. That should be the norm. That will be the norm. I think in the future when little kids go to school, they will walk into the school and press a button on the wall to select their peers for that day, the students that they will learn with. They will press a button to pick their teacher for the day from the Philippines or from Singapore or from Turkey or wherever. We will have this endless hmm, possibilities to learn. So the world really, really is open for learning. And that's why in 2009, I wrote this book. It came out again in 2011 a new version. So we have these possibilities in front of us. We have to start taking advantage of it because it's no, no longer a theory. It is now possible. It is now re realistic. It is now actually required that we think about all the content resources that we can provide to teachers, uh, to, to students, I mean, for the future. And so can now I, I I'll, I'll, can let me stop for a second. Go ahead, Algen. Uh, can I make a confession? Yeah. Uh, you interviewed me for the PhD program. So uh, you remember that? And yeah, uh, before that, I knew that you are going to ask me questions and I read your word is open book before the interview. So <laughs> and then um, you asked me a question and then uh, I gave an answer and you said, did you read my book? And I said, no, I didn't read it, but yeah, I know it. So, but yes, I, I know I need to make that confession. I read your book before the interview. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've heard that from students in China. It was translated to Chinese. Yes. It actually sold more copies in China. Uh, but I remember interviewing you and I think I wrote in the notes, um, he read my World is Open book, we should accept him. <laughs> I, 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 I think I... I think I did actually write that down. Uh, so then, then I made a good choice. 
<laughs> yeah, they, they didn't assign you as my advisee, but okay. Um, so the second, uh, by the way, let me stop for a second. Any, any of your students have a question for me? I'm sure they will. Uh, uh, should we, uh, how long do you think uh, the presentation will take? Well, part two can take five minutes or it can take a long time. So let me pause for one question. Does anyone have a question they want to ask? Okay, let me look at the participants. So if anyone has a question, you can raise hand, whoever raised first, and then we'll get the chance. I'm looking at the participants now. Hello. Before uh, this morning, uh, Turkey time, I met uh, Dr. Bong online and I said, my students will ask you hundreds of questions and nobody raises his hand now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see. Um, well, let me keep going then for a second. So, so, yeah, we can we can keep going for another five minutes maybe and they can prepare the questions uh, and we can so move. David, to the second part of the model is the 20 instructional principles. So David Merrill is a, one of the most famous instructional designers in the world, the gentleman there. And he has a book called The First Principles of Instruction. And you have to activate prior knowledge. What you know is a principle, the first principle and the first principle. You have to demonstrate to the students best practices. You have to integrate all your instruction together to help students make sense of it. You have to have them apply what they've learned. Maybe they apply it through a problem or a task that you've given them. Those are the five principles uh, that he, he talks about in his first principles book. Uh, activate, integrate, apply, demonstrate, and give problems, okay? Those are the first principles. So I created the last principles of instruction, the learning activation system template or last. And uh, some people might call it education 4.0 or 3.0. I'll call it the second part of education 2020. First principle is principle of flexibility. So you give students multiple due dates. I have, I have their papers due in week 14 or week 15. You can pick. I have them get a two day period. If they don't finish, they have a grace period. I have a flexible agenda when I present my classes. As your professor knows, I have an agenda that I pass out and I don't get through it all. Some students think I have to get through all the items in there. I just, you know, we get through what we want to get through, what, what, what happens. And so you have to, the principle of flexibility is extremely important with online learning because, you know, uh, people have different bandwidths. They might not get, hear you properly and might not get in. Um, like the teachers in Botswana where I had to film for them because they didn't have the bandwidth. So you have to be flexible. I had to record some tapes for them record some videos instead of live meetings. You have to be flexible for that to happen. Um, your professor wanted me to come in at, at first at one time. Well, you know, he, I said, well, how about this time? How, you know, we had to be flexible in our time arrangement for when you could make it, when I could make it, and so forth. We also have, have to make a convenience for parents who are working with young babies at home or whatever, make it convenient. So I have my students, they can turn their assignments in many different ways, through a Dropbox, through the course management system, through an email. They can come to my house, they can go to my office. If they live in the city, there are many ways to turn in things. <clears throat> I also teach a class this spring, I'm coming up, I'm gonna teach at, at, on a Saturday morning and the one on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock Eastern time. You know, uh, I got their feedback. When should I teach the class? What time? What day? And so forth. And so, you know, record the class. So this is being recorded. This session is being recorded for students in 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 Olga's class who couldn't make it. You've recorded it and made it available for for the future, right? And also, we want to be collegial with our students. You want to ask, you know, uh, them questions, but in in a in a collegial way. We don't want to hit your students, you know, I had, I went to Catholic school and my, the nuns would hit my hands when I did something wrong and, you know, be slapping me on, you know, um, so, you know, we don't, we don't need corporal punishment. We need to be collegial in nature. We need to, you know, help students um, turn their papers as graduate students into publications. 
We need to treat them as colleagues. When you're at a conference, introduce your students to somebody else to meet uh, as part of a community of practice. We have to, we have to look at our students as um, growing novices who will eventually become part of a, a community of scholars or community of experts as graduate students. But do so, do this in a, in a cheerful, optimistic way. When a student accomplishes something, you celebrate it. You put a notice up, you send an email to folks, you, you praise them somehow, you clap, somehow create a spirit of optimism and cheerfulness. In America today, and I don't wanna to get too political, we've had a spirit of dreariness and angriness, not cheerfulness and optimism, we've had pessimism. We all know optimism wins over pessimism ultimately. Uh, human beings need an optimistic spirit and classrooms that have an optimistic spirit go a lot, you, 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 students will, will do a lot more work for you if there's an optimistic tone, if there's a cheerful tone. Students will go out of the way, your know, students will often say, Dr. Bum, can I do more work? Your assignments are too easy. Let me do, I want, I want to make this harder. I don't want to do a glossary for your class with 100 definitions. I want to create a multimedia glossary. I don't want to write a paper. I want to create a book. Uh, this has happened many times, you know, where they, they, I want to create a book and put it up in a website so people can use it as my final project, right? When you, when I ask students if I can share their final projects, often they'll say to me, yes, you can share, but let me make it better first. When their students want to do more work and they're not getting graded for it, that's the spirit uh, and tone you want in a class where everyone's contributing something. We're, the, the learning theory today that's popular is called contributory learning, participatory learning. It's really not a learning theory, it's more of an environment. We don't need learning theories anymore. We need to create learning environments. There are too many fights about learning theories. Every learning theory works. Every learning theory works to some degree for somebody out there, you know. Uh, a giant whale needs behavioral theory. You know, we shape them. Like my dog, you heard my dog barking earlier, right? We shape them, give them a bone. But we also need high expectations. You want students to excel at higher and higher levels. So I put examples that are really good examples, and then students can do even better and even better and challenge them. You challenge and you support them. You have prior students come back. I have my prior students come back and say what worked, what didn't work, right? So I post their final projects. I, I share them where possible. So they know the bar is high, but they have examples. So now if they were crying and often we get someone crying, they now take the tear comes away because they say, oh, I can do that. I can do that. They see the examples out there. They now have choice. Instead of when I taught them for the first time online, I had four four projects, you had to do four. My students hated me. Then I said, here's 10 projects, you pick any four. They love me. I had my, my TA, I said, Emily, can you give the reminder every week of what's coming due? Because they're gonna hate me, why don't you do it? At the end of the semester, the students loved Emily sending the reminder, they hated me. So in the future, I gave the reminder. I had busy teachers who wanted the reminder, they wanted options, they, you know, Give them choice. Give them case A and case B and case C. Give them a multimedia option and a text option, a document option, and empower their learning. You know, uh, create the syllabus with your students. I have a friend in Canada, in Toronto. He put his syllabus in a wiki and told his students to change it, to change the class syllabus. He empowered them, okay? Give students some some empowerment in what final projects they want to do. I like project-based learning. I'm not so big on problem-based, but I've tried problem-based learning. It's, it's, it's important, but project-based. Let them choose the projects that they're gonna work on, their team members, and present that and, and reflect. Always have reflection on that, right? Um, number eight, feedback and support. This may be the most important principle, maybe, and so you wanna have feedback from the system, computer-based feedback, from experts, the instructor and other experts that might be guest experts, from prior students that come back to the class to give feedback, from peers in the class, self-feedback from your own brain, 
reflection. So there are many ways to get feedback and support, scaffolded job aids, um, advice, tips, all these kinds of things, because we want to reduce some of the tension or turmoil, especially in COVID age, but we also want to be spontaneous and jump up and down once in a while. So that students don't know, you know, what's going to happen next, you know, what you're going to do, you know, what kind of craziness that you might start a lightsaber, you know, battle and so forth. Um, you want to have in your class. So just try it out. One year I said, you know, I'm going to teach this class in reverse from the last module back to the first module. So in my Saturday class, I, one, one, I was getting, I was kind of boring and stale. And I, after teaching it for so long, I said, I'll do it from starting with the ending and go back to the beginning. So that's how I teach the Saturday class now on instructional strategies. And it's worked out. Um, just try stuff out, try things out, combine ideas, uh, you know, find, Right, and if you get a new idea, see in my pocket, these are all slips of notes of ideas in my pocket. So when I get an idea, I write it down and I try it out. You know, I, I save the ideas in all sorts of spaces and places. And, and that way, you know, you don't lose them. I mean, not, no one remembers everything they thought of. You gotta, you gotta record it, talk to others about your ideas, get their feedback on ideas. Spontaneity is not necessarily always totally spontaneous. There's a plan behind it. You eventually get to that spontaneity. There's also the organizational principle. So we got chaos here in spontaneity, and then you got organization, you know, having an agenda, a syllabus, a plan, and arranging it. So people feel, oh, thank God Dr. Bonk is organized. See, if you're organized and you have a plan, then you can have this. You see, if you don't have this, you can't have this. You need both. You need divergence and convergence. So my dissertation, my master's thesis, were about life is a divergent, convergent process. We have to start with divergent, with ideas and springing out. To be a creative person, you have to have multiple ideas. And, and, and you have to brainstorm and just come up with, and then eventually, Combine those ideas, focus in a bit, and organize them somehow. As your professor knows, he took my class and talked about creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration. But so we got we got the organization. We've got to you know plan our. I've got guest speakers in my classes. I've I've written to all they're coming. These, these guest speakers are coming from around the world, and I've written to them last night and organized in Zoom when they're going to come in, what what time, and everything. They're all set up. So you have to organize that, but then we can be spontaneous and we share what we've done. The principle of sharing, as one of your students talked about uh, as we started, it's it, being a scholar today, being an educator today is probably more sharing than ever before. In the past, teachers didn't share. They were siloed. No one observed their classrooms. Today, the job of the teacher is to share. The job of everyone is to share what we're doing. You can't, uh, I used to be an accountant where nobody shared anything, right? It's kind of weird to be in education today and uh, not in accounting and, and being the sharing. Well, part of the reason I changed jobs is to be able to share with people, with people around the world. By the way, the links up there were from a blog post I did uh, 10 years ago about these principles, about the principle of non-traditional learning, where you, you know, you put your, your alternative reality headset on, and you you you, you interact with the world. May may be a might be a, a VR, or AR, augmented reality, or it might be something that's not so technology focused. Like go to an outdoor classroom. At Indiana, we have an outdoor classroom that I take my students to once in a while. We have class outside. That's non-traditional learning. Learning through uh, e-learning today. Um, is maybe no longer non-traditional, but it was for a long time. Learning through passion and inspiration. If the teacher's not passionate, if the teacher's not inspiring, it's hard for students to get inspired about the content. And so, in part, you have to be that course ambassador who's excited about the content, who 
takes that content and repurposes it in a unique way, like a monster syllabus. So students see that content in a different sort of way than what they're normally reading about. Now, I, I know you had Professor Regaluth and Professor Frick. They're passionate about their particular content areas and they've written books about it. You have to be, you know, always thinking about the purpose and the passion and the inspiration. That's the core. That's where learning happens. That's where it starts. You see, you can have relevance and, and meaningful and authentic learning, but if you're not passionate about it, all the relevance in the world might not matter. Students are going to fall asleep. You know, make sure that it's relevant or you will be falling asleep. Authentic, relevant, meaningful work. Um, look up Professor Tom Reeves at the University of Georgia. He has a couple of books related to relevant, meaningful learning with someone named Jan Harrington in Australia. And number 15 is the principle of trial and error. We have to try it out. We have to, we have to try it out in, in, and see if it works. In the past, if students failed, they got an F. You know, in America, they get a big F grade. And now they might get a T grade trial. Trial number one, trial number two, trial number three until we get success. We want to move from T's to S's. And so it's no longer about F's and D's and C's. It's about trials. It's about pilots, P's, piloting, or PT's, pilot trials. Beta, you know, when, when Google has a new software, they call it a beta. Everything, every paper a student writes should be beta. And we move from beta to a final product, right? And so the mosaic bus is in there. Why is the mosaic bus? Well, it's our active learning um, name for on our campus. We're creating active learning spaces called mosaic. And two of my former TAs work on that this project now, um, and um, they're doing fascinating work. Look up Indiana University Mosaic Project and read about active learning spaces. Well, the reason that I had this is that bus broke down. That bus, the mosaic bus broke down. And they fixed it and it's working again. The same is true of students. They might have a failure, what we call failure, but you can fix it. You can repurpose it, you retool it, redo it. Have them redo it until you found success. The student I had today, she's on her second or third dissertation proposal and she finally passed her dissertation proposal. The first one she couldn't do because of COVID. She could no longer do the project. So she had to come up with a new project, okay? So we have, Principle 16, the principle of expanded resources. This tape, you all are watching this tape. Anyone who didn't come to Dr. Ogan's class are watching later. And so this is expanded resources. He's saving this. You can save a podcast, a webcast, a paper, an ebook, an animation, a simulation. All these become part of a class. It's no longer we just read a book and put this book knowledge in your head, right? We now have the possibilities to learn from Yoda, if you want to, or anything around anyone. You can learn anything from anyone else at anyone at any time. An audiobook, right? A webinar like this one is a, I guess we call this a web, webinar, okay? I gotta wake people up. So my influence for writing my World is Open book was from the gentleman on the right, Charles Wedemeyer, and the other Charles on the left, Charles Vest. The guy on the left said, let's make all MIT courses free to the world. So in 2001, they created open courseware. And before he died, all the courses at MIT were available for free. When I was growing up, I couldn't get into MIT. I'm not that smart, right? My scores weren't that good, okay? They were really bad. And so, you know, um, but I could get into Wisconsin. It's a really good school because it's a public university in the state. The guy on the right was at Wisconsin. He created the Open U in the UK or helped create the UK Open University and all open universities. It's Charles Wedemeyer. He created some of the classes that I took on correspondence and TV courses and that kind of thing. I never met him, unfortunately. He has a book called Learning at the Back Door, Reflections on Non-Traditional Learning Across the Lifespan. Every sentence in the book is quotable today. I recommend you buy it used on Amazon for one dollar, fifty cents, or ten cents. Very cheap for you know used copy. In Thailand, they told me to get like 
30 cents. Um, so I don't know in Turkey what you can get that used for, but they came out with a new version. He's been dead for 20 years. So it's, you know, it's, it's not current, but I highly recommend it. You will understand adult learning in new ways, lifelong learning, informal learning, non-traditional learning. The world has become, a, these two Charles, both Charles have opened the world for learning. And this is my book, The World is Open, has 10 trends on the, on the left, it spells we all learn. The acronym is we all learn. And you can read about eBooks and blended learning and mobile learning and so forth. And uh, the world keeps moving. I'm trying to write the world is wide open book. I'm gonna interview people whose lives have changed due to the technologies. Because when I go to Singapore, they greet me like this. And the world's become open. When I go to Bangkok, they greet me like this. When I go to Illinois, like this. When I go to Indiana, like this. And all over the world, people are greeting me. And in, in the, in the, this was in Taiwan. These are people from the Philippines in Taiwan. They're all greeting me like this. So if I could get everybody to hold up their hands, I will take a picture. Will, no, when I, when I that, finish, maybe we'll take a picture yeah, of everybody. Yes, we'll, we'll do that so, in the gallery. So the principle of connectedness gets at social media, trying to get people in, you know, feeling part of a community of practice, feeling a community of learners, to share with one another, to help and support one another, um, to have a legacy for the course, to have prior students come back to the course, to have prior students examples of their class topics, of their class activities. You create some bonding with one another. With one another. To, to, to maybe share a job opening with one another, to share some free resources with one another, to have an apprenticeship with your students that you have one person who's advising another, an instructor mentoring, coaching, scaffolding the, the, the learners through um, reflection, through explanations, through clarifications, through articulation, through uh, uh, coaching. These are all part of a cognitive apprenticeship for learning. Having the, the instructor push the students to explore, push the students to explain, push the students to articulate their knowledge. And then you need vision, a vision and a purpose, as I said, for where we're going to go. That's the key. We need to have, give, if you students, there's a lot of research out there on instructional strategies. If the students are told the purpose, they learn much better. If they're not toward the purpose, the instructional strategy doesn't work. Go figure. <laughs> but you, many times we don't tell the students the purpose. We just tell them to use something, do something. You have to give the rationale behind it. Explain what you're doing. So those are 19 principles. I don't have number 20. I need your help. And so if you have number 20, <laughs> I will. Um, give you credit in my book. I'll put your name in the acknowledgements. Uh, so if you have, if you figured out maybe a possible number 20, send it to me. Those are the 19 principles, sharing, expanded resources, purpose, legality, non-traditional learning, cheerfulness, optimism, choice that we have in the Education 2020 model. Because the kids in Dubai there, Dubai Men's College, and the teachers on, uh, on the left and the teachers in Indiana on the right are now moving to an age of sharing. This is an age where we're no longer learning alone by ourselves, but we're learning with other people. So classrooms designs are changing in this education 2020 world today. And we have to teach people to become better online instructors or online teachers. We have to help them learn more remotely in new ways. So give them options, give them choice, reach out to students uh, and so forth. You know, provide enthusiasm, provide tutorials, provide scaffolds and supports, provide authentic ways to learn, acknowledge your students, um, offer some flexibility within the system. Find out what the technologies they are familiar with, what they're using, and then use those technologies. Encourage them to apply their ideas in the real world and give the purpose and debrief on that purpose. Have them reflect. Every sense, the R2D2 model is about reflect. Read, reflect, display, and do. Always reflect, reflect, reflect. Give the expectations, have the assignments be challenging, and then support those challenges, right? Test the technologies, like 
your professor, Dr. Ogan, and I tested the technology last night. We tested 1230 in the morning or one o'clock in the morning. We knew it was going to work, right? Try interactivities out, polling, breakout rooms, and all sorts of things. You know, make your class a community of learning. Get people engaged in the learning process. Feel the learning that's taking place. I'm skipping over a couple of things here. So learning today is changing. Be more open, more collaborative, more self-directed, more informal. We are, we are learning in many new ways. So part two of this is on my Tech Variety book. I'm not going to go through the Tech Variety with you, uh, maybe some other time. But you can get my book, download it in Chinese, in English, at techvariety.com. And in this, in this handout, you will get, skip over a little bit of this here, some ways to teach that are low risk, low cost, low cost, low time, and so forth. So I'm going to stop there. Dr. Wan, let me tell you, uh, each time I listen to you, I am impressed and inspired a lot. So thank you so much. It was great. So, um, can we see, are you there? Oops. I think he accidentally can, um, okay, let me. Click the end meeting. <laughs> I think I hit the wrong button. Okay, yes, now you're back. <laughs> yes, I was, I, say, I was saying that each time I listen to you, I am impressed and inspired a lot. Thank you so much, it was great. So that's why I can, I can, I and we uh, we listen to you for eight hours nonstop, and we it was great all the time. So I was uh, checking online, and um, I want to share something very quick, and I will give students a chance to ask. Um, I sent a, a link in the chat, but I'm gonna share my screen and show everyone uh, very quick. So this is a blog can you see it was that your final project yes, we um, one of the projects in your class 2010 yeah. Yeah. so um, so i chose to write a blog about um, different types of technologies web 2.0 technology so networks of personalized learning podcasting, webcasting, course casting, interactive and collaborative learning, mobile, wireless, ubiquitous learning, blogging, reality learning, massive gaming. So this is a pro, uh, one of the projects. Uh, so these are weekly blog posts that you uh, asked us, gave options to write. And still I am uh, getting emails from people and then uh, asking for like more ideas. They are sharing comments about my blog from 2010. So yes, this is and I have examples, all, all of them in my uh, resume that I created in your, in your classes. Yeah, you have participatory learning there, which I talked about. I you know. Have. So we can start with Under. Uh, Under has a question and then Fatma maybe. And I don't know how much time you have. Let me ask first that because we planned it uh, uh, till 1.10 uh, in your time. So if you can tell us five minutes or we are we can be done, but so you can decide. As long as you send me Turkish chocolates, I'll, uh, I can stay as long as you want. Promise. Okay. Pro or, and or, I am I am from Malatya. I, I currently live in Malatya, where the, all the apricots uh, were sent to Turkey, um, dried, sun-dried apricots, organic yeah. ones. I'm yeah. going to send you a big box of organic, natural apricots from Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So, you know, uh, what this shows, and I'm moving back to blog that blog that you, I haven't used that in a couple of years, so I'm going to try that this semester again. Okay, so, great. so maybe you can tell my students how much it worked. Uh, that'd be good. Um, sure, I'd love yeah. to. I would love. Yeah, to. send me the link. I will. Uh, let's start with Under. Thank you. Uh, we deeply appreciate your time, Dr. Bonk. It was a phenomenal session, to be honest. Uh, I'd like to ask something about the future of the education. Uh, some of the interviews that you had in Indiana University, I think the program name called Great Conversations. You mentioned that in that video, learners will interact with more vi virtual assistants and instructors in the future. 
So how would you describe the impacts of interaction between machine and the learner in the future? And where would you place the virtual reality assisted learning regarding this? Well, you've asked three or four questions there, but um, <laughs> sorry. in terms of percent, I think that perhaps with by the end of the decade, at least a quarter of our interactions educationally will be with a virtual assistant if you had to create a percent about it um, because there are so many types of virtual assistants. I've got three in my house. My One of my students who's dissertating now sent me one for Christmas for holiday because she wants to pass her dissertation. No. <laughs> so I have Alexa and I have two Google Homes now. And so, um, you know, I can, I can, Hey Google, what's the temperature? Yeah, you probably. She's, I have talking at me now, so um, she's yeah, telling me she can send me more information if I want it. Anyways, uh, in the classroom, in our classrooms, so people have been reshaping classrooms due to COVID to to enable people to come to some classrooms with social distancing with uh, Zoom technologies and so forth, in within 10 years, there'll be a robot, a robot in most classrooms to serve as a partner on Teams for the logic side of things. Um, so the, the robot might be different kinds of entities or um, products that are, are sitting next to us or embedded next to us somehow, but there'll be some type of robots that will be almost like the instructor, assistant instructor. Some of them will be virtual in nature. In fact, Georgia Tech, the studies done at Georgia Tech shows that students can't tell the difference between a virtual robot, a virtual assistant, and the a physical one, the, the, you know, the, the real TA. They couldn't tell the difference between them. So, um, and I had a, a few folks, uh, there's one guy from, one professor in Turkey, uh, his name is Bozkurt. His last name is Bozkurt, B-O-Z-K-U-R-T. Um, I forget his first name, but he's doing research on um, augmented, uh, on artificial agents in, in classroom settings. And he's got, he's doing tons of research now um, I'm not sure if he's at Anadolu University or where he's at, but um, so that's the first first part of your question. The second part, how, to what degree are we going to embed augmented reality and virtual reality in our classrooms? And I just read something literally 15 minutes before you the session about people wanting to move to a next level of gaming within our instruction to be more immersive and, and interactive gaming experiences that they're no longer going to put up with low level gaming activities within their classrooms that uh, that that is going to be the push during this decade. I've got two studies of gaming, um, interviewing um, gaming researchers about how they they've they've done MOOCs on gaming and how they have created a uh, learning environment um, within those particular MOOCs. And that's published, it's, it's online first, it's not published in print yet, but I'll send that to your instructor as well. Um, augmented reality, virtual reality. I see augmented reality impacting us more quickly in some ways, um, in particular in, reading and in science in in in, 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 in I'm not re not read in language learning and in science and I saw some good examples in Miramar or Burma it's in our silver lining for learning show that um, that has taken off within the government in Miramar and if it, if if you can do augmented at, at a cost effective way in a country that is had so much strife as Miramar it's that that's scalable. That's you know what they've been able to do there um, with with a very small company with with small pot of money. It's not this large. It's a couple of people from who finished with their master's degrees at Harvard 
They went back to their country and they're trying to embed augmented reality with all English training and all snow, all science training within classrooms in Miramar. And it's working and they're getting government support for it. So they started small scale and it's grown. Maybe they just got lucky. I pose, I pushed them on it. Did they, you know, is it, how will we replicate that in other countries? But watch that show. It's, it's maybe around show number 30 or so. We had them on about two or three months ago. So, um, I, I, you know, the problem of, of e AR and VR, it's like eBooks. For decades, we heard, this is the year of the ebook. And we'd hear this over and over and over again. And it wasn't until 2009 when my World is Open book came out and it's trend number one. All of a sudden in 2009, ebooks became a real thing that people used because why? Bandwidth issue, uh, because they could do it, uh, storage capacity on our mobile devices, the iPad, you know, uh, tablet computers happened. So tablet computers, whether it's a Kindle from Amazon or the, the tablet from Apple, or iPad from Apple or whatever. So we had the technologies, we had the space or storage capacity, and we had some understanding about the, the type of print embedded that was readable, the tools. So I was on a company for a while as a consultant that, that, that um, guillotine books that, that cut the bindings off of books and put the books through an optical reader it was um, a company called MetaText, and um, they were um, e-purposing those books. They had they they told me they had one of my books they put in and made a, a, a an ebook out of it. There was a company called Net Library that was created in around 2000 or 1999 that started this trend. And by 2009, all of a sudden, you know, we had the it it got to a tipping point. You have to get five to ten percent of people aware and using to get to a tipping point. And that happened. It hasn't happened in AR and VR yet. We've not gotten to a tipping point of five or 10% of instructors utilizing AR and VR or understanding how to use AR and VR or content being made available for AR and VR. So when are we gonna to get to the tipping point? It, it's gonna be discipline specific. I think in medical field, it will happen quicker. In business field, it will happen quicker. Um, so certain disciplines, uh, and public health, public health, that has to happen quicker. We, we've seen COVID and all this other, you know, so anything related to healthcare and, and, uh, business it will happen quicker than in the legal profession, for instance, um, or in, in sociology, for instance, um, in disciplines where there's a, a, a professional disciplines with a lot of resources and organizations that can commit to that and provide the resources for it and the training for it, the training has to happen too. So um, while we see interesting examples, many of the examples of heart rate is from the medical field to show that. Also in music, music's been a leader in uh, virtual reality. Um, so the field of music, the field of business to some, just cause the business has the money. But the field of medicine and the field of music are two areas. If you want to explore augmented reality, uh, if you want to explore virtual reality, those were where I'd go, and public health. If you want to explore augmented reality, I would say the science areas and, 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 and literature, uh, language learning would be two areas to, to look at. So again, it might be discipline specific and it might pop up in certain countries more quickly than others because of government initiatives like in Miramar of all places. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard for us to pin that down. Whereas eBooks or open textbooks was a global phenomenon. It happened across the world simultaneously. And, uh, and, and for countries that, that don't have access to the internet, what happened is people at Amazon quit Amazon and started other companies like the World Reader to help developing countries in Africa get access to millions of books on a cheap device, on a free device. So there are some people who are helping create similar technologies for people that don't have the bandwidth, that don't have the infrastructure to create new types of technologies. My friends in India have created what's called a MOOC kit to help people, farmers in Africa, grow different plants and crops off 
having a MOOC, a class on their mobile devices without a lot of videos. They're, they're, they're creating the contents that are adaptable to the people and what they have access to. So again, what, um, you, to answer your question, it, it really depends on, in part on people that are there creating some the insight and the creativity, the, the infrastructure that exists in, their, in the country and the government initiatives. There's no one answer. Um, does, I'm, I'm not sure if that helps, but looking out 10 years, are we gonna be at 10%? Are we gonna be at, I think in 10 years, we will be for both AR and VR for, for many disciplines, not all though. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have maybe one. Can you hear Fati me? Has a question. Oh, uh, Fat, before Fatih, Fatma raised hand. Uh, but uh, again, so Fatma, then, then maybe the last Fatih. So because okay. we already uh, are over time. So Fatma, uh, Fatma is always asking Dr. Bank a difficult question. She's she's our questioner. So like. Okay. Uh, questioning all the time. I, I love as students asking questions that I need to say, but thank yes, Fatma. Uh, but I'm going to ask a basic one. But, but before that, thank you, Dr. Bunk. It was uh, really interesting and I'm really happy and I know I'm lucky that we have a live conversation with you. I've been like last week watching your videos, so I feel like I know you, but it is different when it's live, you know. So uh, thank you for <laughs> being with us today. You and, paired with um, my videos, okay. <laughs> Thank you for watching, okay. Uh, by the way, I watched this part one and yet I found this presentation really, really inter interesting. I was about to say entertaining, but anyway. So, um, and I read your articles, some of them, of course, and, and I got the free book, so thank you for that. But honestly speaking, they don't do you justice. Your videos are really amazing. It's your sense of humor is shown here. It shines in the videos. So, um, and I think it's a common thing between great educators having a great sense of humor. I'm actually, uh, I'm good at laughing, but not really at making jokes. So I will learn. And yeah, my question is a kind of a basic one. I want, yeah, you said something about um, the most important component when it comes to instructing or especially online learning is planning planning the, the the course so i want to know who is the best to do this planning is it the instructor who's going to give the course the teacher himself or herself or is it better if a specialist do this like an instructional designer or so but uh, in our cases, most of the time, the organization, the administrations are the people who are uh, planning the course, especially in public sectors. Um, the teachers don't have your light sabers. We don't have some kind of like uh, ultimate power, uh, ultimate control. So we can't really plan and do, for example, your uh, R2, D2 or 2020, they're so beautiful, they're so applicable. But when I think in public places, I can't do this because people are keeping their eyes on our work and we can't fail or try new things as as easy as we want. And that's part of the problem. And I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a little question, but it is related. It's about how to, if teachers are the answer of this question, and I really hope that is the answer, I want to know how to motivate teachers because most of them don't want to step out of their comfort zone. I have I struggle a lot with my colleagues because of that. They don't want to do extra work so that pandemic forced them. Yeah, it forced them somehow, but they are not passionate. They, they're not really. I, I need to know how rather than motivating the students, I want to know how to motivate teachers to do some transforming uh, ideas the same as you suggested in Education 2020 or Tech Variety or or um, RT, R2, D2, O. So yeah, did I ask mm -hmm. a lot of questions? I'm sorry if so. Okay, well you sound like a person who's reflecting on education and your role in it uh, at the same time. So that's, I applaud you for doing that. Uh, you're expanding yourself beyond what's required. I can see that in your question, in your questions. 
Um, before I answer your last question, which I have an answer for, um, I want to go back to your opening comments in, in that every professor, every instructor, when they're teaching, is constantly reflecting on their approach to teaching, or they should be, or they're not worth being your instructor. They should be constantly thinking about it. And every instructor, wherever they are in the world, is instructing at least partly based on expectations of others. And that's unfortunate. Uh, I myself have changed my instructional approach over time to adapt to what society expects me and anticipates that I should be. Uh, and my creativity, and sometimes it's been stripped away by the expectations of my colleagues and the administrators and greater society. Oftentimes I was invited to Dubai or to Riyadh and I've gotten an email saying, we want to bring you there because you're funny. And I will tell them I'm not funny anymore. I used to be funny, but now I'm serious. And they tell me I, we're not going to bring you then. We don't want to hear. Um, so, and then partly it's true. I've changed. I used to be really kind of fun. I've changed my, to be more balanced. And so over time, I found my balance between uh, the humor and the seriousness. And, and that's, you know, so you need, you need to have a bit of both. Um, you can't be a total comedian uh, in a classroom. At least I, I couldn't be, uh, but I'd like to try. Um, I find a balance between the, um, the collegialness the counsel, like being a counselor, being a uh, you know orchestra, all those things, all balanced together. And the humor is part; it has to be part of your spirit. It has to be part of your entity, and uh, it has to flow. It can't be forced. It, you know, it, it's 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 part of who you are. Um, and I I find that it provides a safe climate. When the it ha when you have a proper tone, and the climate is the most important thing. You can read from psychologists uh, Carl Rogers and his book called Freedom to Learn. A long time ago, Freedom to Learn for the 1980s was his last. He had, he had different books, and uh, Abraham Maslow, which you may have heard of Maslow's theory. They all talked about belongingness and comfort, and and, and embedding humor in the classroom is part of building that comfort or tone. And, and it really is, it's, it's, it's part one of the tech variety model is tone or climate, right? Why do I have that first? Well, you know, it, it, it has nothing, this has nothing to do with the learning, number one. This isn't about learning, but it has everything to do with learning, right? So that's why it's number one. So social icebreakers might be just your, int your interests, your hobbies, your where you were born, all that kind of stuff, your expectations, your commitments. Now, when you get to commitments, what are students going to commit to? And they, they post it in the learning management system. They want to save face with their peers. So they committed to something as adults that they're going to strive. Humans are goal-driven creatures. We want to have goals that we set up, our expectations and our goals, right? And to have that early on in the class, to have something to re that they've set up the goals. I didn't. I have objectives. I have my goals, but their goals. What are their objectives that they reach to, that they aspire towards? That's why in number one we have tone and climate. I can see their expectations, and I can tell them we'll get to that in week four, in week ten. We'll get to that. Don't worry. Don't drop my class. So, it's sprinkling in the humor every once in a while about that. Uh, enables them to see you're human. And sometimes my jokes don't always work and you know, they fail. <laughs> and right now my brother's not talking to me because I told a joke about his son or whatever. It was a fun, I thought it was fun, funny, but you know, uh, so sometimes jokes can get you in trouble, you know, and so forth. So uh, <laughs> I have two brothers, my other brother's talking to me and actually they're both cool. So anyways, to, to answer <clears throat> your first question about who does the planning, Maybe I'll answer your second because it's easier. How do you motivate? You downloaded the book. What's chapter 14? 
You see that? Number 14, supporting and motivating instructors. You got I wrote a whole chapter. This chapter got from this book. When I wrote this book, they took four chapters or six chapters out of the book to create a small enough book. See, publishers want a, a boring book. They, wanna, they want all books to look the same and sound the same. Just like in, uh, educate, uh, administrators want courses. They all have to be the same kind of course, the same, 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 same. We have to have everything the same. Well, so I got mad at my, my publisher. They changed my title. They could, deleted four chapters. So then I said, I'll publish this book on my own. So that's why this is free, because I got mad at the publisher. And I put that chapter back in on how to motivate instructors. It's in there. There's 10 ways how to motivate instructors. And you know, you have to create systemic change, systemic. So you have to celebrate. Uh, if you want them to integrate technology in their classrooms, you have to celebrate it. You have to make it aware. You have to you have to make it prominent. You have to display it, how, how they're using technologies. You have to have posters on it around your whole building on with a you know showing them. When I created a learning center for kids at risk, for young uh, teenagers at risk in West Virginia, in, in an inner city, the governor of the state flew his helicopter up. They flew him up to dance with the, the kids on the street. They had all a celebration. The news came, but they took a picture of the kids with him in my, I created the computer lab. You have to have something tangible that they can see you take a picture of. So take a picture of, you can't take a picture of thought but you can take a picture of kids writing at a computer screen and smiling, whatever. So put those pictures up on display. So number one. Number two, create a mentoring program where experienced people, it might be young people, are mentoring the adults. So you have to have you know, some kind of mentoring or training program embedded in. You have to have uh, events like a, a technology day or week events where people showcase what they have done. There's, there's, that's three of the ideas. There's ten in that chapter. I don't want to give away. I want you to read the chapter. So that, so, so I've also written an article, recently published, on motivating MOOC instructors. How do we motivate them? Two articles actually. What are ways they're motivated to teach these gigantic, giant classes? And I'll send those. What are the professional development of those instructors? because my students have created a database of 3,000 MOOC instructors. We're tapping into that for a series of studies on the instructional design, instructional design challenges, motivation, engagement, all that. It's not, that doesn't address your question. This chapter directly addresses your question. So that's your last. The question about planning. Here's the Sousa story in the US, what happens. Instructors in universities and colleges, have control for the most part of the planning for their courses. The, the younger the age, often the less control, especially high school secondary teachers and maybe first year college teachers because they can, they can script things, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, the, in most places, even the first year college students, the instructor has total say on how they're going to teach that class. OK, that's why we're evaluated on teaching that class. However, there's another set of entities that sprung up over the past couple of decades, the for profit private universities in the US, not the typical private university, not the not the uh, Duke University, the pro, you know, famous ones or you know, Stanford, not the those are fine. I'm talking about the private or um, corporate, those with corporate control over them, they standardize typically what the instruction is. So you have to be careful in the US about the places that you go to, because some places will be standardized, standardization, and some places will be what we deem more higher quality con uh, content and delivery where the instructor has creative license over what she does or he does. So it's a mixed answer. There's no one answer, but it, it, it and, and by the way, in many high schools, it's changing. So the instructor has more control than they had previously. This COVID age has, has created an opportunity for instructors to have more control. 
to express more and the students to have more freedom. I think this COVID age has in, in many, it's going to many good things will come from it. Many, many good things will come from it because of the, the, the understanding and awareness of the possibilities for creative expression that we hadn't seen previously. The fact that well, I didn't finish earlier, they tried it in the spring. They now have the lesson plans to try in the fall. The reason they didn't do it in the past, they didn't have the lesson plans. COVID forced them to create lesson plans and activities and, and tasks and problem activity and, and projects that they never tried before. And now they've tried them. They've dipped their toe in the water. Now they're gonna try it again. I like, I eat a cookie. I'm not really sure I got a, whole, a box of cookies over here. And, uh, So one of my students, students from China, her mother baked me some Chinese fortune cookies, but they're bigger than normal Chinese fortune cookies. Mm. Very good. Um, you, you reminded me the candies you brought to the class every Saturday. Uh, I'll send these what's left. Uh, and make these cookies. Yeah, Dr. So, Bond was coming with candies every Saturday to the class. So, <laughs> so ah, you've got one. Okay. So you know my weakness. You can send me some in the mail. Um, so you know, uh, she she provided these, and you know, as you know, I I learned to I I tried them out. It was the first time I tried this. A Chinese cookie is it? I, it looks like an American kind of cookie. It's, you know, it's kind of dry, but it's good. I like dry cookies. We got a dark cookie now. I can keep eating. So I'll save you a couple. So I don't know if I answered your all your questions, but to some degree, I I fully agree with you. Teachers need control, but there still has to be discussion about how you're teaching a class so others can learn from you, right? And it can be extended and replicated, and the and the administrators can find out what you're doing, what sharing with them, so they're not controlling you so much. What you have to do to change the, the system is you have to create small successes, and as you create those small successes, you share them with other people. So department meetings, you might show what you're doing with technology at a department meeting, so they can learn from you and use it in theirs. So. Um, we have Fatih had a question. I thought. So, uh, Dr. So Fung, I, I don't know your time schedule, um, Fatih. I I know. So, they. I, I let me tell you. This is the maybe the only uh, seminar that uh, people didn't leave after one hour. So they're still listening to you, and it's 10 p.m. here. So I know you. So. Um, <laughs> If you don't have time or if you are busy or I don't know, Afati can send you a video and then you can maybe send a response back and I can share it with the students. Okay. Or, Fati, ask your question and um, okay. then last question, Fati. OK, OK, thank you so much. I'm really sorry, but uh, just a little question and I really need your advice. Uh, so thank you so much for your valuable time and I really appreciate it. And I loved your green glasses. I had to tell this, sorry. Uh, so I would like to add one uh, question related to the uh, one with my friend Önder, uh, because we two are working on a project about virtual reality and we are basically focusing on how to use the virtual reality games to create a massively online learning atmosphere for the students. And I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, how can we use R2D2 model inside our game? And uh, shortly, you know, uh, we will develop uh, a game where you can put on your glasses and boom, uh, you're in a virtual school atmosphere with like robot teachers and classmates and other living objects. And the player will be able to uh, ask questions to the robot teacher and that machine will give answer back to him. And even peers uh, will talk with him and there will be some tests that he should complete in order to accomplish some achievements and level up and stuff. And after we read your uh, uh, article about R2D2, we were discussing with uh, my friend Önder, like, oh, uh, we can use this model in our game. So, but what to do now? You know, how can we use it? How can we adjust? How can we adapt this model inside of our game? Uh, so we really need your advice uh, on this issue here. 
<laughs> yeah, well, it'll be a long answer. So I'll, I'll just, uh, we can talk on, offline on email after this, um, but I'll just say you're already doing it. When you're answered, you're already listing all four steps, the reflection and the actual doing. Yeah. Uh, maybe you weren't doing the visualization side, but um, you're doing most of the parts, you, you're, you're on the way to success that way. The article I wrote on uh, gaming, I will send you that. Um, okay. So you can, there are 10 things that were being done in gaming settings to try and build engaging uh, massive open online classes. So uh, I think that might be more, uh, more helpful for you. Yeah. I want to have, we have a Gamza in my department and a Merve. Can they say hello? Can I hear their voices so I know what, who they are? Sure. Uh, say hello, everyone. We have some guests from. Uh, hello. 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 Hi, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you very much. It is. is hello, uh, sir. The, do we have someone from China? Hello. Yes. Hello. Hmm? Suyun. Yes, we have Jansu from Jansu. China, but her we call name, her as Jansu. You know, in um, in the United <laughs> States, we have American names. And when you come to Turkey from China, you have Turkish names. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said earlier, we have that book is available in Chinese. So, um, you know, if if you want to download it, neither one. Um, it's available. The uh, Beijing Normal translated it, and the Open U of China has it available in print. So, um, if you're and uh, South China Normal translated two of my books, uh, The World Is Open and uh, my MOOCs book. And East China Normal sells it in Shanghai. So if you're looking for, if you're Chinese and you're looking for them, there are three of my books in Chinese. So, and one of maybe we should create a team and translate uh, what, your new book to Turkish. That'd be nice. Uh, the new MOOCs book, or maybe the the easy one would be the next book. Though the story book will be an easy to translate. Uh, oh, no, but often. why not? So we can start a new start classroom project, and because they're pretty good. Um, There's a chapter from Turkey in this uh, most recent book. So, um, you know, uh, you know, um, Kursat is, yeah. is, so he has a chapter. Kursat, he was yeah. with us last week in my Turkish class. Kursat Chalta, yes. Okay, yeah. From Middle East Technical University. So right. We know. With two of his colleagues in there, so. Nice, nice. Great. I will say hello to him from you. Um, so, Dr. Bank, we have a small surprise I mentioned you before, um, uh, and a, a small memory for you. Let me show. Um, and then we'll have a nice uh, photo together, me. And we have a kitty cat, I see. Yes. Give me one second. So, this is a small memory from uh, all of us, if it shows. Um, Tema is a Turkish nonprofit organization that um, um, is uh, getting donation from people and 